I'm gonna give you all the uh, beginning guide to wholesaling, at least how I did. There's like 10 steps and I'm gonna explain to you each step, okay? Let's get right into it. So the first thing you wanna do when um, you're starting out in wholesaling, you wanna set yourself up with a corporation, okay? An LLC, all right? Um, I got another video that I'm gonna show you that goes into detail about that, but I'll tell you a couple reasons uh, why you should, if this is what you really wanna do, um, it's definitely better for you, okay? You wanna set yourself up with an LLC. All right. Now, in my opinion, the number two step here when dealing with wholesaling is to find yourself a local broker or realtor who's licensed, who's, you know, they're in the business, they've been doing it. Um, they're buying and selling uh, distressed homes. And that's key because, and I'm going to tell you why, because for one, they already have a network set up. Okay, if you're starting out, you know, you definitely want to like build your network and, and you can simultaneously start wholesaling and doing this by building your network as well. And one of the best, one of the best reasons and, and ways I should say, uh, is being a rel, you know, finding a realtor who's dealing with that specific topic, you know, dealing with distressed homes. So they have cash buyers, they have um, you know, a network of cash buyers per se, because they're buying and selling. They're doing this uh, on a regular basis. And number two, you build a rapport with them. Uh, hey, befriend them, you know, they'll teach you something. All right. Uh, who knows? They might like you so much. They might mentor you. So I would say that step two, you know, when, when starting in, uh, you know, the wholesale business is definitely get a mentor or definitely uh, get someone, if you're really serious about this, you know, get someone who knows what they're doing because along the lines of, of, you know, the wholesaling business, you know, a lot of people don't tell you that, you know, yeah, there's a lot of research that you have to do. Don't get me wrong. You're gonna research, you know, if you really want it bad enough, you'll research, right? To find out, you know, the ins and outs of everything, right? But at the end of the day, you want somebody to call or have that, you know, ability to call someone when you're unaware, you're unsure of what you're doing with the deal. Okay. So I would say that's number two, right? Number three, um, you got to find your market. Uh, you got to find your demographic, your market. You know, when I first started out, I was looking for three things. All right. Basically it was the price of the home I was buying it for, uh, anywhere from a hundred thousand to 200,000. You got your demographic of low income, all right? And then you have your middle income, which are homes anywhere from 300,000 to about half a million, somewhere around that range. And then of course you got half a million all the way, um, you know, all the way up to a million and plus, okay? These are three different types of sellers or homeowners that you're gonna deal with, okay? Different types of personalities in each one, all right? So you wanna identify which one to go for. Now, my advice to you is, Go with the small hundred dollars to $200,000 group. The reason why is because there's more cash buyers out there. There's a pool of cash buyers that's buying homes anywhere from hundred to 200000 okay? That's just the way it is. And then, you know, the pool gets smaller and smaller as you go up the scale in homes, okay? And you'll learn this when you're getting in the wholesale. Eventually, you'll learn why. It's because you know, uh, homes in, in this caliber, the middle bracket to the, to the higher bracket, you know, first of all, they, they, there's just, it's a higher price ticket item and you have a different type of seller. Okay. Um, so I would start with the low price ticket items, you know, the one to $200,000 range. Okay. You want to, you want to start there. They'll sell faster. There's a bigger pool. And that's going to be definitely uh, something you want to do. You want to make money faster, right? So number four, marketing and finding deals. Okay. There's two ways to market and find deals. You got deals that's off market and I'll, I'll tell you those. And then you have on market deals. Off market means these properties aren't listed. On market, they're listed with a realtor. Okay. Very simple. Off market deals. Drive for dollars. This phrase is pretty simple. You're driving around and you're looking for distressed homes. 
Um, you know, typically what you look for is blue tarps on the roof and overgrown grass. You know, the house looks, tr you know, trashed or, you know, demolished or even abandoned in some cases, which could be good. Um, also, another way to market yourself when finding deals is putting up bandit signs. You've probably seen them everywhere. You know, we buy homes for cash. You know, um, you know, I'll buy your house cash, et cetera. You see them all over the place in the intersections and whatnot, right? Now, um, you know, there's a lot of different, uh, you know, opinions about bandit signs, but I tell you, if you want your phone to ring, they, they do work. Now there's two ways to do it. You have bandit signs that you say, you know, we buy homes cash, call this number. You're obviously looking for what? A seller, okay? Because you're buying something for cash. They're interested in selling, so therefore they're gonna call you. Now the other type of bandit sign would be, I already have a property. It's a 3-2 in Hollywood or 3-2 in whatever city you're in. Um, cheap, call. Now, you're targeting cash buyers at that point, right? So when they're gonna call, they're gonna call. They're either a cash buyer, wholesaler, or a realtor, or somebody in that industry. So you have two ways with banded signs to actually, you know, uh, accumulate sellers and buyers when doing banded signs that way, okay? Very key in marketing. Uh, the other way is to uh, do public search. Um, typically every county, every city uh, has a public website that's free, okay? This is not gonna cost you any money. And you look up, uh, you know, distressed properties and how do you look that up? So you look up the foreclosure list, okay? There's tax deed certificate list and there's a, you know, mortgage foreclosure list, okay? And when you look at those lists, uh, it's gonna give you the county, the name, the address, um, you know, the lien holders, things like that, but don't get too, uh, you know, confused with that. But basically in public records, it's gonna have the information about everyone you know, uh, that owns the property, who's the owner and things like that, okay? And um, there's other sites that you can pay that actually can get these kind of leads. Uh, one site that I use is called Refax, that's R-E-I dot fax. Uh, they're pretty costly, but they're pretty efficient. So if you wanna get leads that way, that's a good way to do it. Um, and the last but not least, I mean, obviously it's, either knocking on the door, which, you know, during this day and age, you know, people might be a little skeptical about that, but at the same time, um, you got your mask on, but I'm not gonna get into that, but let's just say cold calling, okay? That's one way too. Um, obviously, I have another video that I'm gonna share with you guys uh, about cold calling tactics and techniques that I use that are effective. They've been effective and they use, I mean, they're brilliant. I mean, that's that's the that's the way to go. That's how I'm used to you know doing my business you know through cold calls, uh, and that's the best way to find out if somebody's interested or not. Versus driving to their house, knocking on the door, and getting a get the hell out of here or whatever you know case. So cold calling is definitely something. But I'll have a video about that, um, you know, in my bio there. I'll have a link there for that. All right. So the number five step. Once you get a property, okay, what do you do? How do you offer it? How do you offer a price on it? What do you look for? First thing you wanna do is you wanna do what's called a CMA, Comparative Market Analysis. Now, if you're new in the business or don't know what the hell that means, basically it, uh, it means the comps, comparables that are sold with that type of square footage of the house, the same rooms and bathrooms as a house, and the general area of where the house was sold. You wanna probably look within a 12 month range of what properties were sold for how much with those criteria. Again, you wanna look for the rooms and bathrooms, square footage size, and another one people fail to, to, to say in these videos is you wanna look at what year it was built, okay? Same neighborhood, this house here could be built in 1969, uh, selling for this and then or sold for that. And then the other house down the street was maybe a lot before somebody just built a house and it was built in, you know, let's say 2007, all right? So it's obviously a newer house, so it's gonna sell for a little bit more. So you gotta 
consider that when you're looking up the comparables of what was sold in the last 12 months, all right? Um, then you also have what's called the ARV, after repair value. All right, so the after repair value, this is the, the golden nugget here. Typically, it's called the after repair value. So basically, it's what was sold. So what you do is you take that house, let's say you rehabbed it, okay, and you're selling it, and you would sell it for, let's say, 150000 right? Just to give you an example. Um, typically, you want to multiply that by 0.70% or 0.80%, give or take, depending on what city, what market you're in. Um, it can fluctuate because some investors, you know, it, it depends, all right? Just depending on what market you're in. Just want to put that out there. Uh, I'm in the South Florida, Miami area, so it's anywhere from 70 to 80%, give or take, all right? So that's 150K after repair value times, let's say 0.75, right? And then you want to minus the rehab cost. You want to minus the renovation cost. Then you also want to minus your fee, okay? And that's what you should offer, okay? You'll see I'll have a uh, little diagram here for you. So how do I know what the rehab is going to cost? Uh, how much, you know, by looking at a property, how do I know, you know, what's going to cost me to repair it? Um, don't worry about that too much. Uh, typically, people that are already selling their properties on market, they've already had somebody give an estimate so they can help out. Now, if there's no estimate there, um, there's uh, repair cost estimators. And this is where I say go back to, you know, the realtor that you uh, establish that bond or relationship with. There's a lot of tools that realtors have that uh, will give you uh, what's called the uh, repair cost estimator. Okay. Um, and that's another video that I'm going to put together to give you that. What you know, let's say three to five things that I look at when I walk into a property and what I estimate the cost will be and how I come up with that number. All right, that's gonna be on another video. So stay tuned for that. So let's go into number six. Step number six is making the offer. Okay, so typically after you, uh, you go in and you go after, let's say an on-market deal, meaning it has a realtor there you have the basic offer what you're going to do and again remember in wholesaling you just it's a numbers game it's a numbers game you might have to make i don't know 50 to 100 offers before you get your first deal but don't the, the, trust me the 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 cost per ratio and the value of time that you learn this and it's just it you'll see that it's going to be amazing you're going to make so much money you're going it's going to be well worth it you know, you simply, especially with technology now, you can make offers and just send them DocuSign, like, like super fast to people, to owners, you know? So don't worry about that too much, but here's a huge tip, right? So it's an on-market deal, so there's a lot of people going after it, right? Uh, make sure you look for, you know, properties that are distressed that are going on the market recently within a couple days perhaps so you could be one of the first people to make an offer on it um, especially if you develop that relationship with the realtor now here's here's a huge tip you can tell the realtor that you know you don't have a representative and that you would like that realtor to be your representative now what does that mean well to the realtor it means six percent because typically that's the standard in the industry that they get paid now, that's the payment that a seller would make to sell their home. Now, usually you have a listing agent and you have a buyer's agent. So combined it's 6%, so it's 3%, 3%. So when you're coming in as a buyer, because remember, you're telling them you have a buyer ready to buy the property, you don't have a representative. So you know what? You keep the 3% as well. So guess what that's gonna do? That's gonna tell the realtor like, whoa, you know what? I get 6%, yeah, I'm, I'm in, I'm in, you know? So that's typically how realtors will act. They'll give your contract or offer more precedence than someone else, like a realtor, uh, a, a buyer's agent coming in, you know, because obviously they're gonna make more money. So they're gonna convince their seller to go with your offer, okay? So that's a huge tip right there. Um, and uh, uh, number seven, Number seven, uh, contract. Obviously, it's a, 
It's another video I'm gonna make more in detail, but basically once you have the contract, you send it over to the, uh, the seller agent, right? The real estate agent. They look over the numbers and that's a good thing too because they're gonna take over all the legal documents by the state or city or county that you live in. They'll take care of the contract for you. A couple things you wanna look, and I'll go into detail in another video, but a couple things you wanna look is you wanna make sure that obviously the sale price is what you negotiated, right? What the offer was accepted, right? You also want to um, put down a certain amount of deposit. Typically it's about, you know, depending on what city, county, and state you're in, it could be anywhere from 500 bucks to a percentage amount of the purchase price. Typically one to 2%, give or take, okay? Um, you wanna make sure that's right. You wanna make sure as the buyer, you have after the buyer's name, let's say your name, or let's say you opened up that LLC, you always wanna have in the contract and or signs, okay? That's very key. Um, and something huge that I wanna stress is that you put down for the due diligence period. Due diligence means that it's an inspection period, okay? In the contract, you guys agree upon a price and the inspection period is the time where you as the buyer or your buyer is gonna come in, take a look at the property, see what, um, you know, if they, it, it, you know, inspect the property, like really thoroughly inspect it to see if they really wanna buy it. So you have X amount of days, and I would say typically if you're wholesaling, you wanna put there, depending on what market you're in, which is huge, um, you want to put there a sufficient amount of time, I would say 10 days, right? Uh, to put on the inspection period because, and I'll tell you why, you have that many days to turn around and flip the property to a buyer if you don't already have a buyer, which takes me to step eight, which is marketing your deal. Now this kind of goes hand in hand with uh, sending that deal to the title company Okay, you don't want to send a deal to the title company unless you have a buyer already in line. Why? Because if you don't have a buyer, then that title agency already started the title process, which costs them money, okay? And it costs them time. And you might ruin your relationship with that title company if you do that, okay? That's a huge tip, all right? So before you send it to the title company, uh, once you got it signed by the seller, okay? Um, and you have your due diligence period, let's try to get a buyer, okay? So what did I say? You know, obviously you have your bandit signs out there. You know, you wrote down your cash buyers, you vetted them. Um, you also established relationships with realtors who are doing this and brokers who are doing this already. So they have their stockpile of cash buyers as well, ready to go. So you can market it to these people here. Obviously, you know, social media platforms, online platforms, um, technology is crazy nowadays. So you obviously got to build that through time. But uh, another tip that people fail to realize or say is that you have your circle of influence. These are, what that means is you have people within your circle of influence uh, as family members. So you might want to reach out to family members, uh, you know, call that Uncle Tom over there, Uncle Bill, you know, Uncle Fulanito, whoever, call someone, uh, you know, let them know what you're doing and you know, who knows? You call that rich uncle, rich aunt, whatever, you know, if they're in the business or maybe someone in your family's in the business, might know somebody, that gives you a lot of credibility and it definitely vets them in a, in a different in a different way. And I, that's another video there uh, regarding vetting cash buyers and things like that, or not only that, by getting real cash buyers, okay? So let's say once you got the deal, everything's set, you found a cash buyer, boom. Step nine is sending it to the title company, okay? To start the process, you know, you got the A to B contract, B to C contract going. Um, typically takes about 30 days to close. And um, they usually will let you know the closing date or if there's any issues with title, liens, um, violations, things like that per county. That's the whole reason why they pull title because in order to sell the property, it needs to be clean of all liens, all defects in title, um, anything that's owed, like it could be a past telephone bill, could be a past water bill, uh, could be like an old contractor uh, that didn't get their money, could be a judgment upon them, could be a federal lien with the IRS on the property with the previous owner or the owner. 
So it could be a million things during this process, right? But don't, you know, don't worry too much about that. That's what title companies do. They make sure it's clean and there's nothing to fix. Obviously, this is another video to get into once you get that in depth in this, but you are gonna learn as you go. And that's why I stress to always get mentorship. You know, um, I'm gonna have courses in my bio here that you can, you know, press the link and you'll see what I'm talking about that I can help you through those difficult situations because I actually been doing this for, I would say 18 years now. So I can help you out with that. Take a look at the course, um, check it out or, you know, research. But moving on, let's talk about getting paid, which is step 10, that's the closing agent. Title company has a check for you, you're ready to close, you're signing the contract. So, you know, that means the, the buyer that you have is basically knowing what you're gonna make on it. They'll see it in what's called the HUD statement, okay? They'll see the HUD, they'll see that it's being assigned your name or your company name, they'll see how much it is. Now, huge tip, <laughs> you have wholesaling where you assign the contract and you just get your fee, right? No big deal, but you're talking about any fees that are reasonable to a buyer, okay? Now, Nelson, what if, uh, you know, I'm wholesaling like in Miami where I could typically make 20, 30, 40,000, 50,000 on a wholesale deal. Now, if that buyer's walking into this deal and seeing that he's gonna end up paying 30, 40, $50,000 to you, what do you think he might do? He might back out. And I know this from experience, okay? Um, so that step there to avoid that, it's called a double closing, okay? And I'll have a video regarding double closings where, you know, you close one file, one deal, then it's a new transaction. So now you're the seller selling it to him with the regular standard closing costs and things like that. And they won't ever see that you made 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, $100,000 on a wholesale deal. Because you never want the, the buyer to see that if you're making that much if you're making that much congratulations you're on a different level okay but when it that's a different level of wholesaling okay and i can go into depth with that but i'll teach you guys tricks to that too as well but um anyway um that's the 10 steps i got for you know beginning in wholesaling hope this helps you know, don't forget to hit the like button, definitely, and smash that subscribe for more content, all right? Thank you. Peace.